Uh, welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Dr. Ken Yurish. Uh, Ken Yurish is an MD, PhD. He's a high volume knee and hip replacement surgeon and also a researcher that creates a lot of new technology. Ken, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's great being here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks for coming on again. Yeah, why not? Yeah, for sure. Good discussions. Absolutely. I always enjoy talking to you, and it's fun recording these as well. But, you know, it's fun because I actually, you know, my background being in surgery, uh, it's such a different space here with robotics. I always learn a lot when I hear whoever else you have on. It's, you know, it's very educational, kind of broadens my horizon, expands my interests. Thank you for checking them out. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what we're going for. I feel like it's maybe a little bit too nerdy sometimes because it goes really, really into the weeds. But um, the people that like it seem to really like it, so I appreciate that. Uh, my, my favorite discussion is still the uh, the controllers, uh, the... I don't even remember their names anymore, but I was in like the Arduino, versus the Arduino the yes, awesome. Yeah. That's my goal. It's good stuff, and I agree. Well, and I, I feel like you're one of those people that actually understands the stuff too. Because a lot of people, I mean, they're just not enough of a nerd. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're insinuating or implying. <laughs> Cheers. So last time we talked, um, we had a bit of a weird, kind of funny, joking debate about like surgical robots and I sort of adopted my dad who's also an orthopedic surgeon's viewpoint of that it was a gimmick and maybe a waste of time just to play devil's advocate because I'm a roboticist and I thought it would be fun to take that alternate stance where you defended it um, but um, yeah I don't know um, if you want to say like why surgical robots are bad in your opinion um, I, I wouldn't use the word bad but you know when these were first getting started there was a group of people that were very pro-robot, and there was a there was a group of people that were very, uh, you know, anti-robot. Of what are you going to be losing? And you know, in the field, you know, so for background, you know, I'm primarily hip and knee joint replacements, and so, um, you know, robots have been around for maybe the last few years, and it's becoming more and more evident that they're probably not going away, and they're here to stay. Um, and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of great advantages to the robots, but to stay somewhat balanced and not quite as biased, I think there's a lot of there, there's some things that you lose, and it's it's an interesting example of uh, probably across many different fields. You know, as you go more robotic, what what gets lost? You know, so it's not like the bad things about robots, but it's you know what's the cost? Like where what are you going to lose because you're doing more and more of this? Okay, so like one example would be atrophy of skills. So if you know how to do a manual surgery or you're a machine tool operator or you're somebody that installs solar panels or, you know, any number of things, um, as you become to rely on the tech, you know, are you losing those skills? So if the robot went out, is that going to cause a problem? Yeah, you know, the uh, one of the, you know, it's sort of an interesting way to think about this, but a, a knee replacement surgery is really this, it, it's, it's a surgery where degrees and millimeters matter. And the ability to consistently do it with manual instrumentation very reproducibly and as accurately as we do within you know, our, our kind of range here is we want plus or minus three degrees is actually a really impressive accomplishment. It's a really highly developed school set that it takes hundreds of thousands of repetitions to really nail into that sweet spot. Wow. And there's, there's, you know, we're talking a little bit more about this, but what gets lost if you start doing everything robotically, because that ability to use the manual instrumentation, you're, you're just not going to have that same skill set anymore. And I'm not saying that's bad or that's good, or it's just, but, but it, it's worthy of a discussion of, you know, what's the cost of losing that group, you know, there's a group, there's a, a large number of individuals in the field yeah. that are, have developed an unbelievable expertise in being able to put in this knee implant very reproducibly, very accurately. And now you're going to start to migrate away, you know, and, and it's not that we're doing that now, but as you start doing more and more robotics, are, do you, are you going to lose that? Like, you know, what's, what's the final place with all this? How, and, and when I do these talks on robotics and, and the advantages, disadvantages, um, you know, one of the things that I bring up is that it's, it's, different, it's different ways to accomplish the same task. One's not better than the other. This isn't a debate of robot or no robot, but it's what are the advantages when I do it with a robot? 
and what are the advantages or what do I like about not using the robot? What's a better way of stating it? Yeah, and because it, 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 it pulls, you know, we're, we're, we can, you can become so kind of uh, dichotomized on, and, and, and it becomes so debatable that it's, it's, some of this is avoiding the debate. It's just, where is this good and where is this bad? Yeah. Or not even so bad, bad but what, what's what the point the of each one? <laughs> Sorry, I made that. No, no. And, yeah. you know, we were, so when we were talking on the phone, you know, the one example I bring up is with woodworking. And, you know, you could have an automated CMC machine router do some really complex piece of woodworking, you know, where you're like, wow, that's beautiful. But it's on rare occasion that I actually watch a YouTube video on watching a router machine some <laughs> kind of piece of wood. Whereas, you know, if I'm about to build something with one of my kids and I'm trying to figure out how to do that online, you, you see these crazy YouTube videos where they take a trunk and they make a bull out of it. And you're like, that's spectacular. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's this high level craft and skill set that's, I think, sometimes becomes undervalued because... You look at a robot and you're like, oh, the robot can do it better. But, you know, there's a lot to be said when, when you can do something just as well with your own two hands. Yeah. Well, and I quite like bespoke, you know, items. And I feel like maybe there's a risk of losing some of that, too. I mean, if, if you've got a one size fits all. or I mean, I don't know. I know you can sort of change models with artificial intelligence. And by scanning, you can get a better picture. So maybe that's not the most fair analogy. But um, I don't know. There's something to be said for, you know human judgment and craft and, you know, kind of coming up with uh, different ways to adapt to the inputs you've got to the problem. Yeah. And, you know, this is my bias is my background and training from coming from a, a perspective of learning how to do a knee replacement with manual instrumentation, right? I'm the, the person that's making this, you know, fine wooden furniture with no power tools. And then all of a sudden you have power tools. Well, there's a lot of really neat advantages and efficiencies to that. But my ability to appreciate those efficiencies and to do certain things is because I was trained on the manual instrumentation. There's a lot of very fine points on a knee replacement that I understand because I developed that school set with those types of tools. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't know if, if this is good or bad, but if somebody started training on all robotics you know, do you, what do you, what do you lose right now? Yeah. You brought up the point you, you can focus on other things that somehow might make yourself even better, which is a possibility, but it's interesting because I think we're kind of reaching a, a point with all this of what, what gets lost when I feel like we're in like the early 1980s, like what happens when the robots take over the world? Yeah, for sure. Judgment day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a story I've heard, and this probably isn't the most fair analogy, but I'll bring it up anyway. And, and, See if it makes sense. So I think it was about an Airbus plane that went down and crashed into the ocean. And the example that I heard as to why it happened, I can't remember what book I read this in. It might have been Smarter, Faster, Better, but there was there was some book about and and the premise that it was making was um that when people are too reliant on offsetting cognitive load, when something goes wrong, they've lost the ability to know how to handle it. And so in this case, um, I think it was the altitude sensor on the plane had malfunctioned because it had iced up. And so the people in the cabin didn't really know how to handle it because there were just alarms going off and the autopilot wasn't doing its job correctly. And they ended up just crashing the plane because they panicked and didn't do anything. They didn't know how to, they didn't know how to fly the plane yeah. on their own without the assistance. Yeah, and they probably would have been able to, like if they had gone back and thought about flight school. And, and But in a crisis situation, I mean, you sort of just revert to instinct as you know so i, I don't know uh, i don't you know how that applies to surgery or not you, you know when I, I i can't recall a time this has happened but whenever i'm doing something robotically with a knee replacement um and because it's a little bit of a newer field if i'm doing something where i'm pushing the boundaries is the wrong word but something that's a little bit more pushing the technology like you know it's, maybe it's a more of a novel use of the technology cool the or, or taking a concept and using it in a different place, you know, so not a typical place to be using it. Um, I have a safety net. I always know in the back of my mind that if I don't like where we end up or if I feel uncomfortable, it's not a big deal. I can just turn the robot off 
and I can finish the rest of the case with manual instrumentation. Like I, you know, I know my exit pathways along the way that I've never completely committed to whatever I've done with the robot. Nice. That's awesome. And, you know, it's kind of like the same idea. And now then the flip side of that is that you need backup systems for the robot if you don't like what you're seeing or other ways to check it. And I'm, I'm sure that that's going to be developed, right? This, this t yeah. Especially on the surgical robotic side, it's such a new concept that as we get further along, people are going to start to kind of check these boxes off. Yeah, and I mean, just looking at some of the surgical robots being developed, I mean, there's a huge amount of money and resources and just mental firepower and horsepower going into solving these problems. I'm sure you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, interesting. What kind of, uh, I guess, can I ask, like, some of the ways that you've pushed the limits of that technology? Or well, It's, um, you know, it, 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 maybe to keep it a little bit more, you know, less debatable, you okay. know, it's, yeah. it's you, you have your easy cases and you have your more complex cases. Okay. And so with, you know, manual instrumentation, if you've got a, a, a knee that has some, you know, bone-on-bone -bone arthritis on one compartment and it, it, there's really no deformity, right? The leg is pretty much still straight up and down. And then you can have a more complex case where um, it's, you know, bone-on-bone -on -bone arthritis beyond that, where now there's a lot of bone loss. Uh, and instead of, you know, your mechanical axis is supposed to be 180 degrees, you know, pretty much like right up and down the middle. Whereas now you could have like, we call it varus valgus, but you could be you know, like 30 degrees of varus, right? Like it's completely bow-legged. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, it's, so it's the people that you see pelvis. walking around with bad arthritis yeah. where, like, their leg is completely bent in one direction. Th those become more difficult cases. And so it's how do you take the robot and, and, and start to implement these, these different kind of facets of, like, well, with manual instrumentation, I would do this. And so robotically, I can use maybe some of this manual, these little techniques I know on the manual side, to adjust where I want it to be to do this. Nice. That's really cool. You know, and one of the other things I've, I kind of find interesting with robots is that, you know, on the surgery side, it's not always robots, right? So if, if I tell a patient I'm going to be doing a, a surgery robotically, they have, and this is actually, I use this in some of my talks, especially, you know, a group of people getting knees are in their, you know, 60s, you know, 50s, a little bit on the younger Not side. Not the most for, uh, bullish but, crowd for yeah, robots. Yeah, definitely, very atypically in their 20s. Very, yeah. very, very atypically. Um, you, you get this image of this like lost in space robot, <laughs> right? Where there's, yeah, there's this huge robot walking into the room <laughs> and it's about to do your surgery. Like it's, <laughs> it, I could tell that they're having that visualization because oh, when wow. I ask them, you know, this is actually something I might consider doing robotically and you, they get this look on their face. I'm like, we should talk about what robotically means. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go, you know, this isn't lost in space for about walking into the room. And then you literally, you, you'll see the look of relief across their face and that's realizing awesome. that it's, that's kind of ridiculous to think about. And, and, and this is sort of how I think of how manual instrumentation and robotics sort of augment themselves. Um, it, it's really about measuring and quantifying. And so with manual instrumentation, I want, you know, we think of it as soft tissue balancing. I want a certain space uh, in extension. And then as the knee bends through flexion, I want it to kind of match those. We call it matching the gaps or gap balancing. Where if I take out, you know, we only take out a few millimeters of bone. Cool. Um, you, but you, between the, your thigh bone, your femur, and, and your leg bone, your, your tibia, you, maybe you only have about nine or 10 millimeters of space after you make all of your cuts when it's an extension. Well, when I go up into flexion, I want that same amount of space so that that gap is balanced. And if you have a lot of deformity on one end, the inside, the medial or oh, the outside, the lateral, you know, could be different sizes, right? So not only do I want it to be a perfect rectangle and extension, so but, medial, lateral, just yep, function, okay, yeah. Nice. But, but then, as I go up into flexion, I want that same kind of space, yeah. and we have lots of ways to measure that with manual instrumentation. And I, I look at robotics as just sort of another step in quantifying what those are. But there's also the added ability to then adjust my implant orientation just a little bit to make it from what I think is a little bit more perfect. Nice. You know, and, and so I, I use it and it probably kind of, the more I think about this, I, I think it works in a lot of these more hands-on uh, technical trades where, you know, 
I, I was trying to figure out a way to explain this to my patients. And I was on a, on a boat and I saw a map and I was, I said, that's it. You know, doing a knee with manual instrumentation is like being a captain on a boat with a map that does, if you really know what you're doing and you're highly trained, you can, you can go across the world and you're gonna be just fine. Yeah. And that, you know, we have different jigs and tensioners and, and we call them blocks and ways to measure how we're doing that tensioning or, you know, that, that gap balancing in, in with knee replacements with conventional. And then when you do it robotically, we have now it, it, we have a new tool to measure those differences. It just happens to be called a robot. Nice. You know, and it's the reason why I brought up the, the analogy with a boat is you have maps, but then you have GPS systems. Yep. And if you're out on a boat, you know, you're chartering something somewhere, you're going to see a map, but you're going to also see that GPS system and the captain's really using both because if the GPS goes down, really not a big deal. He's a good captain or she, or, you know, that individual is a good captain. They know, sure. they know how to sail a boat, <laughs> but you know, if they're like where I think I am doesn't really make any sense. And they're looking at the map and they're like, this is backwards. They can look at their GPS and go, oh, I'm, you know, I, I was in the wrong spot. Yeah. So it's like they complement each other. Yeah, you know, that's actually, I'm going to use it from now on. Exactly. And, and, and so when you were talking about those differences between, you know, I, I, the only, the best phrase I can think of right now is pushing the limits, but it's when you're doing a more difficult case, Yeah. it's how do you complement the two back and forth? Because and, and, and that's maybe, this is, this is kind of maybe leading us to where we were trying to talk about before. Sure. The difference is, is I do a better robotic surgery because of my training with manual instrumentation. I have this entire other tool set that I can pull in. Nice. And I think it makes me more efficient than stuff I would do with a robot. That's awesome. Yeah. But the, the flip side is, I think when I'm doing a knee manually, it has made, or my, my experience for, with robotics has made my manual knees better because Interesting. I have a better, you know, if you do a knee replacement, you're waiting one month or three months before a little bit of an idea of the final product because in that early post-op period, the patient's still rehabbing. You don't, little things that you did, you don't see the response of, right? So I'm always looking three months back or one month back of like, this person did really well. What did I do differently? Or, you know, Gosh, I thought I'd always did it the same, but this person isn't doing as well. You know, did, is there something that I did not see? But you know, I've noticed that you get that instant feedback with the robot of, I put it exactly like this. And it's a, a, a precise way of measuring what you're doing. And they come back in a month, and if they're doing really well, you're like, I put it in exactly like this. Look, all the people that I put it in you know, like this they all do really well. This is what I should be aiming for. You get that feedback. Nice. And and so that also helps out with you know, with when you're doing it manually. Because like, now I want you know like this. The geometry that helps yeah. in the robotic case. Yeah. That's awesome. So not the lost in space robot. No, not the lost in space robot. More all. more more like R two D two three C three PO. You know, it's a little <laughs> bit more like nineteen early nineteen eighties through through now. Although I don't. I don't know if we're allowed to measure trade, uh, to, to mention trademarked robotics. So, you know, certain large movie studios will be contacting you on this. Yeah, um, highly prescribed, subscribed uh, podcast. Yeah, very, very highly subscribed. You, well, you're getting a few uh, thousand hits now. That's really impressive. That's better than well, any 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 podcast that I would be doing. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, it's been fun to make. I, I enjoy doing these. I appreciate you being one of the first guests to come on to. Um, really, a shot in the arm to have someone as awesome as you come on and uh, I'll listen to you. No, it's Grace are humble. <laughs> no, it's, it's like uh, the Saturday night live where they started talking about like the, the, the host that would come back multiple times, you know, like hitting like three or more like hosting episodes. Did you ever see, this is totally in the weeds, but I'll, I'll do like a quick one. Then we'll go back. Did you ever see Norm McDonald's uh, intro to Saturday night live? No, but it would have to be spectacular. It was amazing. <laughs> I'll recommend that uh, for after. <laughs> But and now edit back on. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you talked a bit about 3D printing for surgical implants. Okay. Um, and we talked about maybe some of the uh, pros and cons of the porosity that's inherent in 3D printing. So for people listening that don't deal with 3D printed parts, whenever I have something 3D printed for a robot or for work or for a prototype, um, oftentimes it's a little bit rougher. There's kind of like a, I don't want to say like a sandy feeling, but it's it's got... 
it's it's kind of grainy on the edges, um, sometimes porous. So I, I've seen you know expensive metal 3D prints where like you can dip it in a chemical or in water and it might retain some moisture because there's cavities in it. How does that come into play when you're 3D print? And I guess how do you even figure out how to shape that implant or where do you use them versus a conventional implant that's machined? You know, so it's you know we very quickly touched on this before, but so now hearing you explain this, I find it very interesting. In orthopedics, you know, one of the one of the things that makes and th this is a little bit more on the hip replacement side. Hip replacements are incredible because they literally become a piece of you. Yeah, it makes sense. And and so, if if when I put a, a, a cementless uh, uh, femur and the acetabular component in, they have parts of them have a rough com uh, rough texture to them that is very precisely modeled. Ooh. to allow bone to grow onto the implant so cool. and around it. And so, you know, if you kind of hold your hand up and you put your fingers up in the air, you could kind of imagine that that is your, your, the implant surface. And literally when you put it in that the, you broach your, you ream or whatever we're doing, it's a smooth bony surface, but literally the bone with the right geometry will grow and wrap around that texture. Cool. And literally, become a like you can't it's 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 welded on like the, you can't take it out unless you have very precise instrumentation that disrupts that implant bone interface to literally take the whole thing out i have so many questions but i don't know and it, the, the science behind this is really cool because it's not like any textured surface if the texture is too big then you don't have the right biology to encourage the bone to grow and wrap around Interesting. And you get this thing called fibrous on growth. And, or actually, I might be getting this part confused a little bit, but if, it's, if the porosity is too small, it's not, the bone isn't big enough to grow in, and you still don't get the right bony, the bo you don't get the bony in growth. Wow. And so orthopedic surgeons working with cementless components, we love texture. It's, you know, <laughs> it makes us feel good. <laughs> and, you know, some of it is the, uh, when you first put it in, if you have more texture, there's a higher friction coefficient. And so it gives you more stability when you're trying to have a nice tight fit. Nice. But having that right texture also allows you to have, to optimize bone in growth into the implant. And so one of the first uses of 3D printing or additive manufacturing from orthopedics perspective is you'd have your normal machined implant and they, they would 3D print on whatever type of coating they wanted. You know, so these usually it's titanium. And so you have your titanium. And I'm just going to pick an example of your, the acetabular component, the part that goes up into the pelvis. They would then 3D print on whatever type of rough and texture they wanted because it gave them a better surface for bony on growth. That's interesting. And so you hate the rough, but I love it. <laughs> I guess it depends what you're trying to do. That's a good point. So. Yeah, and, and the flip side of that then is for knee replacements where we want something very smooth, right? Because if you have your femoral component, the part of the femur articulating with a bearing surface that's sitting on your shin bone, the tibia, yeah. you want something really, really smooth because you don't want, that's just, it's just going to create particulate debris when it's rubbing against itself. And, you know, you don't, it's like having a, a finely functioning motor where after thousands of thousands of cycles you know it's like not having the right oil and you having machine debris everywhere. Yeah, yeah and it, it just it, you know it mucks the whole system up yeah it makes a lot of sense you know and so you know when we when we talk about additive manufacturing um for for the certain applications where they're starting to use that with something that's a bearing surface like that um and, and even with the the pieces where you have that bone on bone articulating you know, when I mentioned to somebody, oh, you could 3D print that as an implant, they just assume that you stick it, you know, you put your CAD design in and the 3D printer, whichever one you're using, just kind of it finishes and you pull the implant out and you're like, okay, we're, we're set to go. We can put this in. <laughs> I, I think people really lose the, the large number of post-processing steps. And it maybe large isn't the wrong word, but the number of post-processing steps you have to do afterwards to, to get it ready to use. Interesting. So I guess I've got a few questions. Um, I want to ask about those post-processing steps. I'm curious about going back for a moment to the porosity piece on something that you want to encourage to grow onto an existing bone. Do you build and plan those pores intentionally or is it just the pores that come out of the process or coincidentally the right size? 
for bone bone on growth or bone in growth? Uh, that so for from the three D printing perspective, I the the rough number you're looking for, as I recall back to I mean this was forever ago. It's, it's I believe it's like fifty to one hundred and fifty or fifty to five hundred or one hundred to five hundred micrometers. It's you know there's this sweet zone of like right around there. So that's like the RA you want? Like the, yeah, like you kind of want it like right in there somewhere. Because if you go much smaller, the bone's not going to grow in. You know, much bigger, you're not going to get the right, you're not going to get the right grab. And so I've always assumed that the the people that specialize with additive manufacturing, they know their they know their system well enough, like the technique to the the, the powder that they're starting with and the the type of technique that they're using. That if they do that that certain way, that they're going to get that specific type of hole afterwards like that kind of rough texture yeah it makes but a lot of sense that that's that's the extent of what i know about additive manufacturing for porosity no i'm gonna bug one of my friends from ge additive after this and just ask him so many questions well you know and it's interesting because you know a lot of the additive manufacturing stuff came out of airline you know with airline machining Wait, and, really? yeah well that's i mean that, that's the story that i've heard well i guess it was turbines for rocket engine blades when i was at spacex back and they were saying this on the tour i don't think this is anything crazy and secret uh like ge does it too uh, as far as i know for their jet engine turbines and i think it's because the geometry of a turbine is difficult to machine conventionally i mean you need like a crazy multi-axis machine to get in between the blades because they're overlapping and there's overhangs and so it seems easier to 3D print them in some cases. Yeah, there's, you end up, I mean, the example that I've heard is that it allows you to start building pieces that you could never machine because if, you know, the machining piece, because you have to whittle away from a solid piece of metal, there's parts that you need in there because you'll never really take them out. Whereas, you know, you're building something from nothing with the additive manufacturing. And so that gives you, you know, it's just like the, the analogy we're using between conventional and robotic, yeah. it's, you know, you get to kind of flip what you're doing and have a different way of, of building or measuring what you're doing. Yeah. And I mean, I know from working for, with additive that it's not a one size fits all, but when you need it, you need it. And it's a useful augmentation to subtractive machining. Yeah. And so maybe it's, but the, the reason why I pay attention to the airline industry with the machining part is so the sort of the natural for making implants the a, a, a solid machinist they a classical kind of way they kind of move up and i'm this is not my area of expertise so i'm sure there's lots of ways to get there but from what I, the way the machinists have explained to me you start in the automobile automotive industry and then like the next level above that is uh airline you know airline uh implant and implants but you know uh, different airline pieces you know for the jet engine or whatever type of part that you're going to build for an aircraft cool and then you kind of move up to the level above that with medical devices nice and so 3d printing that makes a lot of sense you know you and you start with you know this the simple stuff or not simple but you, you start with the airline pieces and and then when you really have a handle on that well it makes a lot of sense for the airline and we know how the machinists work you move on to the uh to the the medical implants that's, that's awesome. awesome so every aerospace machine shop is basically a revolving door to, to get, get to a medical, medical machine shop. That part I have no idea about. <laughs> but but, yeah, but, but when you bring up the, the turbines... That, that makes great, sense. It's a harder thing to make. Yeah, well, you, you, when you talk about the turbines, that's really interesting because that's also something that you'd imagine you'd want really, really smooth. Yeah. yeah. Well, on a lot of those surfaces, I mean, especially because like a rocket or a plane has maybe like a you know, 10% margin of safety or less in some cases because of the importance of weight reduction, which I'm, I'm also curious. Like if you 3D print... An implant, do you have voids that are printed onto the inside of it to make it lighter? They're not doing that, but it's such a, you know, there's not, I don't want to say, there's only one example that I can think of off the top of my head of implants that, that are on the market and FDA approved that have, are either, they, they either are or very soon will be planned to be completely 3D printed. Cool. Um, and, but, you know, and so it's such a new thing, you know, it's kind of, it, the sky's the limit of, and, and, and it, very similar to the idea of, you know, robots versus manual instrumentation, what are the advantages of an additive and what are the advantages of the, the old school machining? That's awesome. I also saw, I don't know if you're familiar with this, I'm sure you are. I recently saw a, um, a laser uh, demonstration from like a, a German laser manufacturer where might have been a Swiss company. I could be getting this wrong, but anyway, uh, they were showing the ability to 
move a five axis laser around a machine part and then basically like engrave a surface roughness depending on what the application wanted. And they didn't say what it was for, but they mentioned it was used a lot in biomed. I wonder if that's... Yeah, I would be, I'd be really, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, and one of the other things that, you know, and this is kind of like the, the great examples of like the old school way versus the new way, you know, um, if, if I'm going to machine a piece for an implant and I order, you know, say I'm going to be doing this out of titanium, almost all implants for the knee or the hip are made out of an ASTM standard, right? So you go to the Home Depot and, you know, any building material, you'll, you'll see ASTM and some type of number on it, right? So because I can buy a piece of PVC pipe and it doesn't matter who made it, it meets that ASTM standard for whatever everyone, when they were all sitting around in the room, all the PVC makers saying like, we should build it like this. Yeah. So you, you know what you're getting. And you know, it's the same thing with an implant. It doesn't matter, you know, if I'm a vendor or if I'm, you know, one of the implant companies, I'm going to build a, a, a titanium acetabular shell and I'm going to source my titanium. It doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but I know that I can order it from a number of different vendors and I'm going to get the same product. I'm completely oversimplifying this. No, for sure. I've had issues where yeah. I asked for one alloy and gotten another. Yeah, but, but if they, they follow the standards and you trace it out, you'll yeah. be able to detect But you have, at least you're starting from a somewhat known position of this is the same type of titanium if I get it from here or there or there. Yeah. And, you know, that's an entire order of magnitude from, so I am going to now, you know, have this powder to print my titanium. How, where's my variability here? You know, is, if I build it with this lot, do I get a different type of material property when I use a different type of powder? And like, or how do you test that for that kind of, that, that, uh, quality control, so you're always knowing that you're getting the same thing. Mind-boggling to me. Yeah, for sure. there's so many things that can go wrong, and I feel like the things that'll go wrong in a week are way different than the things that'll go wrong in a month. They're way different than the things that'll go wrong in a year. Are way different than the things that'll go wrong in ten years. Well, so. you know, and you know, I I, I like to uh, uh, very respectfully joke around with my patient that everybody gets a you know like the the fifty year implant, right? The, so the oldest hip replacement I've ever <laughs> seen in place is. It was a few weeks under 40 years. And so wow. you know, my goal was, wouldn't it be awesome to, you know, be around 50 years after your practice gets started and have one of your, you know, your hips or your knees show up. Oh, that'd and, be great. Yeah. And, and, but there's that failure within the first year, which, you know, for a lot of the things that you're doing, you're, if you're building a jet engine, you know, what's the lifespan of that implant? It's probably only a few, I don't know a lot about it. It's probably only a few years before it gets replaced. Whereas, uh, our, a lot of the stuff we do in orthopedics, I like to joke around, it's sort of like NASA, where you send this satellite or this ship or this probe out into outer space, and you you can look at it with a telescope or you can talk <laughs> back and forth, but you know, you're never going to be able to do maintenance on it. Or, you know, in our case, yes, but that's surgery, and so that's a big deal. Yeah, when I, I was talking to another guest that came on the podcast about sending robots up to catch tumbling satellites and service them, but I think that project never got completed. <laughs> so it goes more to your case. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, it, it, when you're dealing with these, these kind of, these small, when we make these differences in, in, in our industry, in our field, it's not the, what does it look like at one year, but we, you know, we need to have that perspective of, is there anything that's going to be changing at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you know, these really, and how do you even test that? You know, it's, it's really hard. Wow. Yeah. I would imagine. When you, when you go into work on an implant that, I guess, if you go into work on a knee where there's already been an implant there, does that sort of change the, how you would approach the surgery? I'm sure it does. But oh, yeah. I guess what's, what are some of the differences? Um, so it, it, if you're going to be taking everything out, it doesn't, it, it, I, 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 I shouldn't say that it doesn't matter. It's, it's very useful to know the type of implant because each, each kind have their nuances with how they're built. Where, you know, there's certain implants that might be a little bit easier to take out than others. There's certain implants where, uh, based on some of the geometry for their metal, it's, it's been well established that they can be really hard to take out because it's hard to get around a ledge. Oh, or, brutal. you know, certain, certain things where you're like this. So you that need to be familiar with, mind. yeah, the, like, uh, I don't want to name drop any different types of implants that so are hard or easy to take out. I won't even know if you do. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, um, <laughs> The, but there's, so having that historical appreciation for the implants that aren't being used anymore is useful because 
you, you can predict problems or challenges or obstacles in the surgery where um, if, so that's, so if you're gonna take everything out, well, it's nice to know what it is because these are what I should expect and how I can take it out and that kind of stuff. Whereas if you're gonna do a partial revision where you're gonna keep some of it, well, obviously you need to know what's in there because you're gonna be putting the other half, the half of it, what you take out, you're gonna have to put the half back in again. Oh, wow. Right, you know, so if yeah. you're doing a certain type of knee replacement made by, you know, whatever, I, I don't know if we're allowed to name Company it. X. Yeah, Company X, only because you know, when I'm faculty at different courses and we're supposed to like not mention companies, so like I'm trained not to mention them. But Probably safer. Yeah, but <laughs> the uh, Company X, you know, makes a, you know, a company or a, a, a Z type of implant. You know, you can't mix and match the femur in your tibia, so you have to put the same type of femur back in or you have, you have to know that they they correspond appropriately. Do you, when you go in to do a revision, do you typically put the hardware that was already in there back in? Do you always strip it out and put new stuff in? Do you ever leave like the femur implant in, but then replace the yeah, tibia exactly. implant? Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, so that partial is you leave one and the other one, it may not be the same thing as before. It may not be the same thing as before, but um, you, uh, you know that they have to be compatible with each other. Okay. So that's usually, you know, if you're using company X's implant, they have a list of, it can be used with these other specific types of implants that we also happen to make. Yeah, probably that makes sense. Um, that's interesting. I'm just, just thinking through that. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's sort of interesting because you know, I don't, you know, this is kind of common sense stuff to me because this is what we kind of deal with every day. And, you get these questions from people that don't know quite much about it of, oh, I can't believe you do that. That's incredible. <laughs> or, you know, when I print something, I want it to be very smooth. You know, like something that was machined where I'm like, no, uh, uh, roughness can be good. It's your friend. Yeah, add, add the roughness. Yeah. Laser that on, machine yeah, so that I'll, on. I'll take, it's like cheese on a pizza. It's like, oh, I'll do some, some extra cheese, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, so now I remember what I was going to say. So I was thinking about... Um, it's just incredible that you would open up um, the knee or, or somebody's hip and you would go in to do a revision, but then the hardware that was in there, at least on one side, might be so good that you just leave it, even though that's the most opportune moment you're ever going to have to replace it. You know, if it's not broke, why fix it? And yeah. there, there's, there's nuances where, um, so especially like we, we do this up with hip replacements all the time where you have one, we say it's, uh, it's this one component that's well fixed. Why, why take that out? Yeah. Sometimes you need to, but... The, for compatibility purposes mainly? Um, it, it more, mostly because if, say I'm going to do a revision, you know, that's what we do when we go back and the, the pelvis component, the acetabular component's loose. Well, that's, that's why we're there to fix it. Um, but the femoral component, the part that's in their thigh is well fixed. The, you know, it's going to take a long time to get that component out. Well, why take it out if I don't need to? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then so, but, but, and it's a little bit easier on, on, on hip replacements because there's a little bit more compatibility and ability to mix and match. But knowing how you can put the two different things together is very useful. Yeah. Well, I guess as, you know, with an engineering background like I've got, a lot of my recent sort of focus has been on preventative maintenance. Not a lot of. It's part of the, what I do, you know. Like, well, if we're already opening up a system to do all this work, why not replace all these bearings? Because they're eventually going to go bad anyway, and this is the easiest it's ever going to be to replace them. So it's interesting to know that like when you get to a certain level, you know, I mean, just because of, I guess, the level of fusion with the bone and the implant or why, why how fix expensive that. it is or the amount of hours or the complications you can introduce if you go in there. Yeah, why mess with it? Because it's, it's an enormous amount more work and you get, it, it's only diminished returns in certain cases because it's just, it doesn't give them any added benefit in the surgery and it only introduces more problems or co potential complications down the road. That makes a lot of sense. But, you know, it's interesting that you bring that analogy up because when people ask, well, there's certain types of things where I need to, there's, there's modular pieces in say a hip replacement where you can pop them on and off relatively easily. And so if I'm, there's certain types of surgeries where I need to change the femoral head because they're having an issue with it being metal. You know, so we call it corrosion and they've got a cobalt chrome head. And the analogy I use is all I technically need to do with that surgery is change the head to something that's ceramic. So it's not metal anymore. And that stops the process. But if I'm looking at another modular component, the liner, even though it doesn't have a ton of wear, maybe that's just a little bit, why not replace that? Because it's not a hard thing to do and there's a little bit of wear there already. And so that's, and 
historically that's the weak link with the hip replacement. It's the the liner wear. Nice. Why not? Why not just change it? And so I, I liken it to the the spark plugs and an oil change. Oh, that's cool. You know, yeah. if you've got this, you know, unbelievably expensive race car, and it's going to take <laughs> you all day to open up the hood and get down to like that little space in the middle, and you're looking at the oil pan, and right next to it a spark plug that you just have to unplug and put a new one in. Might as well. Why wouldn't you? You know, that now if sense. it's going to take another five hours to get that part out, then I say, well, then then we don't change it. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. So it's discretionary. It just yeah. depends on the circumstance. Yeah. yeah. Smart. Cool. I guess if I if I can drill down deeper, what kind of materials are the liners made out of? Because that's obviously got to be soft. You're replacing cartilage, I would think. Uh, that's it. That's a really great story on how the because that was historically the weak link the weak link uh, with hip replacements and so it started out as a so it's a polyethylene liner oh cool and they were you know they learned that you could use a uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene liner and I you love got that better, material yeah they got better wear out of it and then somebody much smarter than me uh, in the late nineties uh, figured out that if you if you made it highly cross-linked, it would have even better wear properties. Oh, cool. And and the driving force behind all of this was, they called it cement disease. And so when they first started using cementless components, the um, you'd get this wear and you could get really bad osteolytic change. And basically, the bone would sort of resorb away around where the bone was kind of grown on, and it can also what happen. What does resorption with, mean? Just like yeah, the, the bone the bone disappears, right? Okay. So the bone's supposed to grab it there, and then you know you look at your X-ray, and then all of a sudden, like half the inside of the bone is gone, ah, and the implants loose. Brutal. And you know this was also happening with cement, but they called it cement disease. And actually, as it turned out, because um, they thought it was you know from the, some of the cement particles, but what they learned was that this is actually coming from the poly polyethylene debris interesting where you know, you've this got this very yeah you've got this very smooth and this is when they were using all cobalt chrome heads for the most part so a metal head rubbing against a, a plastic liner you would get this certain volumetric wear from the liner from just the cycles rubbing back and forth over and over and over that and makes over. a lot of sense and it turns out that if you have a certain there's a threshold where if you get a certain amount of volumetric wear at a certain size it activates your, uh, it activates the um, osteoclast to basically, re which is the immune system, immune system cells that differentiate and basically they're part of either building or taking apart the bone. Well, these cells show up and they start to resorb bone. And uh, now all of a sudden you have bone loss. It's like, what's all this debris doing here? Yeah, That's it, bad. Yep. You gotta get rid of it. It just activates the system in there to start resorbing bone. Brutal. And so the, and, and so the, the big limiting span for life space, for lifespan of the implants before was this, how much debris did you have floating around in the wear from the plastic liner? And you know, they made incremental changes with the chemistry. And the last major one was, cool. you know, I'm, at, this is it's roughly 2000 because highly cross, the, ultra, the highly cross linked polyethylene came out like right around 2000 ish. Interesting. Um, was, Thank you, by the way, for that material. Yeah, <laughs> no. So good robotics. And um, the, but it kind of solved our problem. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've used ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. I'm guessing it was cross-linked in a few applications. And I know when you're trying to sand it in a machine shop, it will not ablate. Like it's impossible to get a chunk to come off it because it just wants to bunch up and oh, not stick together. shed off. Yeah. It's, oh, that's it's, really kind of interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, and even if you use like a mill on it sometimes, I mean, you can get chunks to come off with a mill but it, the tendency is that it wants to gum up and, and not a blade off. So it's, it's kind of interesting to uh -huh. hear your story and then think well, about so, my experience. And the robotics and this material. is me learning. Where, where are you using the highly cross-linked or the, you know, the, the polyethylene with the robot? So you would use it as like a bearing surface. Okay. Um, yeah. I've seen it on the, on the bottoms of jet boats and, and autonomous jet boats where you use it to account for like hitting rocks because it doesn't get oh. really knocked off that badly or if it does you can just replace the whole plate who so. would build a jet boat that sounds awesome <laughs> well, i think in this case it's like an impeller under the water but yeah they're sweet and so there's ones people make for whitewater um exploration where you can you know go right up a creek 
and uh, there's a lot of rocks. So to, to be able to go over the rocks and not damage the, the hull of the boat, uh, you put this UHMW plate on the bottom. So And so you have a jet engine submerged yeah. in water. I think it's I think it's just a conventional engine. You could be wrong and just make it up because this would be so much fun to drive. <laughs> I don't go down the rapids. I go, it's like the most interesting. So I can talk about off orthopedic things. It's like Dos is the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> you know, like he, he, he studies Russian literature in French. You know, <laughs> when he goes to Rome, he does as they do, or they do as he does. <laughs> and then when he, when he sees rapids, he goes up them, not down them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I learned about that from a buddy of mine uh, who I actually worked on a boat with, I want to say a little over a decade ago, and um, we did a composite hull. So ours was, um, it was a thin layer of wood, maybe an eighth inch thick, and then over the top of that we had um, fiberglass for tensile strength. And then on the keel, uh, which is the bottom of the boat for people listening, uh, I know you know that, but you know, anyone else, uh, for, the, for the bottom of the boat we had, um, I think it was Kevlar. Um, for abrasion resistance, so you could drag it up onto rocks. Yeah. So like similar philosophy. So, but I've seen it. I've seen the UHMW thing on like crafts the marine use the marines use. I think it's it's popular for just stuff that's meant to take a beating. And yeah, I've seen it in battle bots too. People will put UHMW armor. It's like a cheap way to armor your battle bot because you can just replace it between matches oh. with titanium. You you don't want it. You want to deflect. Where UHMW is meant to be able to take the hit and absorb it a little bit. And maybe in those cases, you do have a little teeny bit of blading off, or you end up with a dent. But relative to the amount of impact you're able to take, you know, it doesn't really allow your opponent to get a good bite. So this is, this is actually awesome because one of my next steps here is I, a buddy of mine that I, I trained with um, has his kids doing like the, the kid version of battle bots where you can get like this. Kid. Oh, oh, is this the, the high school 15? No, no, this is even better than that. Yeah, okay. they have these Listen. intro build kits. Oh, Really cool. Yeah, for yeah, where it, it starts out really simply, where it's made out of balsa wood, right? And so nice. it, it you know it takes you five minutes to build them in. And I, I completely like I have it uh, as a book link somewhere because my kids aren't quite ready to use them. <laughs> but awesome. then they have a more, and this is sort of like the um, this the next level above that where it's a kit for like the early like the mid elementary through middle school where. You can't build the stuff on your own yet, but you can sit down with your parent and build a battle bot. And, and they have this entire league set up where you know, they go kind of from town to town That's doing, awesome. oh, and it's the best. You know, so it's like, it's like the, it's the new version of like the race car derby, right? You That's know, you, really cool. Well, I've seen a lot of parents with their kids at like, you know, the three pound and the one pound class in particular, like with the onset of 3D printers, you can bang those out really quickly. So I'm not really doing it anymore, but five years ago, I was much more into the sport and I remember, um, yeah, there were a bunch of parents with their with their kids. You probably have a blast. Oh yeah, no, and so we have these kits that I'm getting ready to buy them for their birthday and, nice. and Christmas, which it works out well because I don't I, don't don't take it personally. I don't think they subscribe to your podcast because they, <laughs> they don't have any electronics. Perfect. But yeah, I'm we're gonna be we're gonna be shielding them with I did because I never thought of this with high molecular weight polyethylene. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, get some from work. You know? And they, yeah, they can attack you with their like their their femurs, you know, like <laughs> chopping down. That'd be hilarious if you were able to get like a disused implant <laughs> to make it into battle bot armor. Mm. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Yeah. No, it's always good to find new uses for the stuff you knew about or different applications for it. Yeah, I never actually thought about that stuff being used outside of orthopedics. Yeah. But, well, I think it came from orthopedics. So yeah. We were learning about it in school. Um, like I can't remember what professor, what class I was in, but somebody was telling me it was developed for like uh, joint replacement surgeries yeah. and. That's why we have this awesome material you know, that we all enjoy using. and Which is interesting because so many things that we do in orthopedics has come from dental, right? So like a lot of the, our initial our polymethyl metacrylate, I may be pulling this a little bit, but it was initially being used as something with dental stuff. And, you know, this was like way back in the day, decades ago. So there's so much stuff that we kind of pick up in ortho that was probably first started on the dentistry stuff. That's interesting. Like, like actually, what one of, of stuff or yeah, yeah. So one of my favorite examples are uh, uh, tooth implants, right? So if if you want to have osseo integration for a implant, one Maybe of the bone growing onto the implant, yeah. Okay, and cool. so uh, uh, you know you can you can buy these. And I 
I forget on the the ortho, not entodontal or orthodontal. I, I'm, I'm so horrible with these words. Um, you have a missing tooth. You get a tooth implant where the screw goes up into up into the uh, up into your skull or down into the mandible, whichever side. Oh, interesting. And you know they do a little drill, and sense. you put the, the 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 attachment up in there, and the bone grows on, and you, we call it osseointegration, so that that piece of metal is now literally a. A piece of you. You have to like allograft, or can you just go in with the no. right porosity? Yep, and you just okay. yep, and because it's the, we call it press fit, where typically the diameter is a little bit smaller than what you're putting it into, and so it it gives we you that, that initial hole. Yeah. And um, then you can screw up the dental implant and attach a dental implant to that piece of metal, and so that's the classic. Uh, that's the and which I find unbelievable because in my background, I focus a lot on surgical infection. How that never becomes infected, I do not understand. It's amazing. <laughs> a great orthopedic example of that um, is for amputations. You know, one of the kind of newer technologies being developed is if you have a below knee amputation or an above knee amputation, yep, you take, uh, you use, you, instead of having the implant attach onto your outer stump, which is the skin. Yeah. You know, that's really hard because your skin is not meant to have a fixed, rigid attachment onto it. And so if you're an amputee, your um, maintenance and taking uh, maintenance of like problems you run into with, with the, what we call the stump yeah. can be really hard because it, you know, it, there's a lot more friction there. There's a lot more wear. If you get like a little bit of bruise or an ulcer, like that becomes an issue to how does that heal when you're still using your implant? And you need your skin to be structural to hold yeah. your prosthesis on and so the solution is well and, and you can't do as much with it because it's it's not as rigid as if it was actually attached to your bone yeah and so if you could imagine having a like a little calmer device like you know thinner than your glass you know maybe like the size of your thumb screwing up into your femur oh cool and attaching there you could then screw on your implant. I've heard that's a nightmare from keeping it from getting infected. Perspective, uh, oh, so uh, this is not my area of expertise, okay. but they're, you're doing it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know what the rates of infection are, but it, it's, it works well enough that that's you, awesome. But, but you know, that's a great example of something on the dentistry side that and this was actually, this is well, developed by a group out in Europe. I just forget their name where, you know, this has be been over a generation now. Date, Cause I haven't, I haven't looked at that problem for about four years. And I remember I asked my dad about it because he's like, you know, he's the easiest guy with subject matter expertise that I can call. And, you know, I mean, he just retired like two years ago. So he was sort of on his way out at the time. And I was asking about, you know, could you for a prosthesis for something I was doing and I kind of outed myself a little bit by pointing the arm. But could you, um, you know, attach it that way? Yeah. You know? And it, he was like, no, it'll get infected. Yeah, no, so no. it's good to know people are overcoming Yeah, it. I don't know if they've done it for the arm prosthesis, but th and this is especially out of a lot of the military trauma. Um, by um, now that the implant is directly related to the bone, you avoid a lot of the stump issues. Nice. And you theoretically have, and this is where I'm kind of speaking out of my expertise with it, but the logic is that you now have an implant that's going to work much better. Yeah. Because you have a rigid attachment to your bone. So it makes a lot of sense. it's way more efficient. You know, it's, you don't have, and you don't have to worry about any of the stump care or any of the stump issues that pop out. That's awesome. But the flip side of that is, you know, now there's, there's new problems, you know, the infection or whatever else. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's really cool. I saw, um, a woman, I want to say it was maybe about a year ago who had just the coolest prosthesis I'd ever seen. Like it, it <laughs> it's going to sound bad, but it looked like something out of Terminator. Like there was this red LED circle on the side. Uh -huh. And then it was, I, I met her at a bike, a bike, bicycling event. So she was able to ride a bike and then be hanging out after the event. And it had a motor in it. It was active. Oh. And so it was, it was, I just don't see this stuff that often. And I, I think I was staring at her cause I was so fascinated by her prosthesis. I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but that's the coolest prosthesis I've ever seen in my life. You know, like she told me what brand it was. I kind of wish I remembered because it was so interesting. To, to yeah, the, the technology behind yeah. the, the technology behind um, the implant design and how they're built with the materials and the kinematics is it's it's really cool stuff. Yeah, well, with the active stuff that's coming out now too. Like, I mean, just as a robotics person, that I get really excited about it. I don't know to what extent that's being adopted, but just to see one of those in the wild made me really happy. Cool. Awesome. Well, 
I think we're probably at like a good kind of natural uh, toning down point. Is there anything you want to plug or talk about? Or I'm just I'm just always happy to receive an invite from you. Hey, so we'll do my it again plug soon. is you should listen to more collaborative with with Spencer Krause. And, Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Subscribe keep, today. Keep the shows going. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, I mean, the more people that subscribe, the more we can do this. Uh, really appreciate you and really appreciate everyone listening. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. No, thanks for inviting me. Take care.